Prices are not costs. Prices are what pay for costs. Some things are believed because they are demonstrably true, but many other things are believed simply because they have been asserted repeatedly and repetition has been accepted as a substitute for evidence. Often it is those who are most critical of a Eurocentric view of the world who are most Eurocentric when it comes to the evils and failings of the human race. As a young Marxist in college, during the 1950s heyday of the anti-communist crusade led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, I had more freedom to express my views in class without fear of retaliation than conservative students have on many campuses today. No one is equal to anything. Even the same man is not equal to himself on different days. Beware that many of what are called social problems are differences between the theories of intellectuals and the realities of the world. Differences which many intellectuals interpret to mean that it is the real world that is wrong and needs changing. Perhaps the most important thing about risk is its inescapability. Particular individuals, groups, or institutions may be sheltered from risk, but only at the cost of having someone else bear that risk. For a society as a whole, there is no someone else. Nothing could be more jolting and discordant with the vision of today's intellectuals than the fact that it was businessmen, devout religious leaders, and Western imperialists who together destroyed slavery around the world. And if it doesn't fit their vision, it is the same to them as if it never happened. The term liberal originally referred politically to those who wanted to liberate people mainly from the oppressive power of government. That is what it still means in various European countries or in Australia and New Zealand. It is the American meaning that is unusual. People who want to increase the power of government in order to accomplish various social goals. Systemic processes tend to reward people for making decisions that turn out to be right, creating great resentment among the anointed who feel themselves entitled to rewards for being articulate, politically active, and morally fervent. What is called planning in political rhetoric is the government's suppression of other people's plans by superimposing on them a collective plan created by third parties armed with the power of government and exempted from paying the costs that these collective plans impose on others. Gun control zealots compare the United States and England to show that murder rates are lower where restrictions on ownership of firearms are more severe. But you could just as easily compare Switzerland and Germany, the Swiss having lower murder rates than the Germans, even though gun ownership is three times higher in Switzerland other countries with high rates of gun ownership and low murder rates include Israel, New Zealand, and Finland. The purpose of education is to give the student the intellectual tools to analyze, whether verbally or numerically, and to reach conclusions based on logic and evidence. Ours may become the first civilization destroyed, not by the power of our enemies, but by the ignorance of our teachers and of the dangerous nonsense they are teaching our children. In an age of artificial intelligence, they are creating artificial stupidity. The fact that crime and poverty are correlated is automatically taken to mean that poverty causes crime, not that similar attitudes or behavior patterns may contribute to both poverty and crime. Practically every individual has some advantage over all others because he possesses unique information of which beneficial use might be made, but of which use can be made only if decisions depending on it 
are left to him or are made with his active cooperation. Such are the ways of politics, where the crusade of the hour often blocks out everything else, at least until another crusade comes along and takes over the same monopoly of our minds. People will forgive you for being wrong, but they will never forgive you for being right, especially if events prove you right while proving them wrong. In short, numbers are accepted as evidence when they agree with preconceptions, but not when they don't. The monumental tragedies of the 20th century, a worldwide Great Depression, two devastating world wars, the Holocaust, famines, killing millions in the Soviet Union and tens of millions in China, should leave us with a sobering sense of threats to any society. But this generation's ignorance of history leaves them free to be frivolous until the next catastrophe strikes and catches them completely by surprise. If you have no right to disapprove, then your approval means nothing. It may indeed be distressing to someone to have you express your opinion that his lifestyle is disgusting and his art, music, or writing is crude, shallow, or repugnant. But unless you are free to reach such conclusions, any praise you bestow is hollow and suspect. Have you gone crazy, Lefty? No, on the contrary, I have become educated. Sometimes that's worse these days. Nowhere in the world do you find this evenness that people use as a norm. And I find it fascinating that they will hold up as a norm something that has never been seen on this planet and regard as an anomaly, something that is seen in country after country. The essence of bigotry is denying others the same rights you claim for yourself. Green bigots are a classic example. Ideology is an instrument of power, a defense mechanism against information, a pretext for eluding moral constraints in doing or approving evil with a clean conscience, and finally, a way of banning the criterion of experience, that is, of completely eliminating or indefinitely postponing the pragmatic criteria of success and failure. That such an administration could be elected in the first place, headed by a man whose only qualifications to be President of the United States at a dangerous time in the history of the world were rhetoric, style, and symbolism, and whose animus against the values of the institutions of America had been demonstrated repeatedly over a period of decades beforehand, speaks volumes about the inadequacies of our educational system and the degeneration of our culture. Wrongs abound in times and places around the world, inflicted on and perpetrated by people of virtually every race, creed, and color. But what can any society today hope to gain by having newborn babies in that society enter the world as heirs to prepackaged grievances against other babies born into the same society on the same day? Price controls almost invariably produce black markets, where prices are not only higher than the legally permitted prices, but also higher than they would be in a free market, since the legal risk must also be compensated while small-scale black markets may function in secrecy, large-scale black markets usually require bribes to officials to look the other way. The intelligentsia in the media can decide what to emphasize, what to downplay, and what to ignore entirely when it comes to race. These may be individual choices rather than a conspiracy, but individual choices growing out of a common vision of the world can produce results all too similar to what is produced by centralized censorship or propaganda. In the United States, 
government regulations are estimated to cost about $7,800 per employee in large business and about $10,600 per employee in small business. Among other things, this suggests that the existence of numerous government regulations tend to give competitive advantages to big business since there are apparently economics of scale in complying with these regulations. The vision of the anointed is one in which ills such as poverty, irresponsible sex, and crime derive primarily from society rather than from individual choices and behavior. To believe in personal responsibility would be to destroy the whole special role of the anointed, whose vision casts them in the role of rescuers of people treated unfairly by society. We should not be surprised to find the left concentrated in institutions where ideas do not have to work in order to survive. Any serious consideration of the world as it is around us today must tell us that maintaining common decency, much less peace and harmony among living contemporaries, is a major challenge, both among nations and within nations. To admit that we can do nothing about what happened among the dead is not to give up the struggle for a better world, but to concentrate our efforts where they have at least some hope of making things better for the living. The fundamental confusion that makes income brackets, data, and individual income data seem mutually contradictory is the implicit assumption that people in particular income brackets at a given time are an enduring class at that level. If that were true, then trends over time in comparisons between income brackets would be the same as trends over time between individuals. Because that is not the case, the two sets of statistics lead not only to different conclusions, but even opposite conclusions. The costs of achieving justice matter. Another way of saying the same thing is that justice at all cost is not justice. What, after all, is an injustice but the arbitrary imposition of a cost, whether economic, psychic, or other, on an innocent person? And if correcting this injustice imposes another arbitrary cost on another innocent person, is that not also an injustice? Nothing is easier than to get peaceful people to renounce violence even when they provide no concrete ways to prevent violence from others. It is far easier to concentrate power than to concentrate knowledge. That is why so much social engineering backfires and why so many despots have led their countries into disasters. Treating the causes of higher prices and higher interest rates in low-income neighborhoods as being personal greed or exploitation and trying to remedy it by imposing price controls and interest rate ceilings only ensures that even less will be supplied to people living in low-income neighborhoods thereafter. Freedom must be distinguished from democracy, with which it is often confused. So that our choices are either to blame society or to blame the victim. Yet whose fault are demographic differences, geographic differences, birth order differences, or cultural differences that evolved over the centuries before any of us were born? The crucial question is not whether evil exists, but whether the evils of the past or present are automatically the cause of major economic, educational, and other social disparities today. The bedrock assumption underlying many political or ideological crusades is that socioeconomic disparities are automatically somebody's fault. Lamenting the vagaries of fate may leave us with a galling sense of helpless frustration, which many escape by transforming the tragedy of the human condition into the specific sins of societies. 
This turns an insoluble problem of cosmic justice into an apparently manageable issue of social justice. Since the sins of human beings are virtually inexhaustible, there is seldom a lack of examples of wrongdoing to which intergroup differences can be attributed, rightly or wrongly. Where the quest for injustice is overriding, among the things it overrides are logic and evidence. Seldom do people think things through foolishly. More often, they do not bother to think things through at all, so that even brainy individuals can reach unattainable conclusions because their brain power means little if it is not deployed and applied. In short, honesty is more than a moral principle. It is also a major economic factor. While government can do little to create honesty directly, in various ways it can indirectly either support or undermine the traditions on which honest conduct is based. This it can do by what it teaches in its schools, by the examples set by public officials or by the laws that it passes. These laws can create incentives towards either moral or immoral conduct, where laws create a situation in which the only way to avoid ruinous loss is by violating the law, the government is in effect reducing public respect for laws in general, as well as rewarding specific dishonest behavior. While greed is one of the most popular and most fallacious explanations of very high salaries of corporate executives, when your salary depends on what other people are willing to pay you, you can be the greediest person on earth and that will not raise your pay in the slightest. Any serious explanation of corporate executive salaries must be based on the reasons for those salaries being offered, not the reasons why recipients desire them.